Well, good afternoon. I think I have a tough spot because this is right around when your blood sugar starts just dropping right off. And so don't worry. As long as you don't fall out of your chair, it's all good. Okay, let's see here. So uh, as Gary mentioned, I am the regulator for paramedics in Saskatchewan. What that means is uh, in Saskatchewan, we are, our, our profession, or your profession, I should say, is self-regulated. So um, we issue licenses and oversee practice and define scope of practice for our practitioners in the province. And uh, in amongst all of that, we've encountered some really interesting things. And what I'm going to speak about today is uh, medical assistance in dying. And this isn't necessarily end of life care as much as it is ending life. Um, and so, although this topic is probably somewhat common in other countries, in Canada it's very, very new. And the implementation has not, has, whoops, did I do that? That's okay. And the implementation has not been without problems. Um, because initially, as in most other countries, uh, medical assistance in dying is really only um, administered by physicians. But in Canada, it's slightly different. So we're going to go through a little bit of a, a little bit of an information session, um, just to give you some background, and then I'll tell you exactly how it's impacted the paramedic profession in our province. So the objectives of uh, my presentation today are to provide you with a basic understanding of how our new law in, in this area impacts paramedic service, to identify potential areas in which paramedics can become involved and do become involved. Um, to talk a little bit about the implications of paramedic involvement in it and to share some practice challenges that we've already encountered with respect to what we call MAID. So as a bit of background, um, Canada, uh, not considering Quebec, uh, is relatively new to medically assisted death. And a major shift occurred with the Supreme Court decision in 2015 called Carter versus Canada. And this decision underscored the needs to reconcile the interests of patients and providers. So in Carter v. Canada, it was a landmark Supreme Court decision where the prohibition of assisted suicide was challenged as being contrary to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And so um, the key person that, that challenged it was Kay Carter, which was a woman suffering from um, degenerative spinal stenosis, along with Gloria Taylor, a woman who had ALS at the time. So th in, uh, in February of 2016, or 2015, uh, this, the court struck down the provision in the criminal code giving Canadian adults who are mentally competent and suffering intolerably an enduring right to a doctor's help in dying. And the court basically allowed um, 12 months, it suspended its ruling for 12 months to allow the government to get its ducks in, an in a row and arrange the necessary laws. And in January 2016, they granted an additional four-month period to the ruling to allow time for the newly elected Liberal government to consult with Canadians on drafting the law. But in the meantime, what they did was they allowed provincial courts to begin approving applications for euthanasia until the new law was passed. So criminal code changes were necessary um, to allow patients to access medical assistance in dying and to remove the potential for criminal prosecution under the criminal code. So um, the new provisions basically defined who could assist in, in medical assistance in death. Um, the parts of the criminal code that prohibited MAID would no longer be valid. So um, under the new law, eligible adults could request medical assistance in dying, and in this way it would, it would allow people a bit of opportunity for self-determination if they had what, would, what the courts have considered an irre irremedial medical condition. And it also provided a bit of protection for those who were considered vulnerable. Uh, the net result of this is that um, healthcare providers still have the freedom to object as conscientious objectors, but they're required by law, even if they object, to provide information about all end of life options. And they have to provide a referral to another healthcare provider who will participate. And so it becomes, that becomes a really important note because if you're not part of the, the identified professions that can help people end their lives, you don't, you don't have necessarily all this information to make that referral, but you still have an obligation to make it. Um, and then the third party agency or service could also um, um, provide transfer of care to another provider. Basically, the MAID led specific medical practitioners to assist a patient in ending his or her life. 
the law is very, very specific with respect to who can assist. So right now, only medical practitioners, which are physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, and pharmacists can participate. Only these three people or three professions can assist in providing or dispensing medications to assisted patients. The indemnification does not protect anyone from civil prosecution or complaint to a regulatory body. Paramedics are not included, and yet significant potential exists for them to become involved, and I'm going to speak very specifically to that. So despite the changes to the criminal code, it's still a crime in Canada to assist suicide or to counsel people to commit suicide unless you're exempted under MAID. And this is really important because if paramedics become involved in any way in, in administering end of uh, something that's going to end somebody's life, potentially they could be charged under the criminal code. So just as a bit of additional background, what is medical assistance or medical assistance in dying? Well, two, two options exist, um, and they both include participation of a nurse practitioner or a physician or, or two physicians or, or whatever. Um, but basically, you can have direct administration of a substance that causes death, which is uh, voluntary euthanasia, or they can give or prescribe uh, medication that's self-administered, which would be medically assisted suicide. And depending on the jurisdiction, um, right now, I, I believe that um, it's really just medical assisted. I'm not certain that any other jurisdictions are yet allowing self-administered. Um, there we go. It's not easy for a patient to be deemed eligible for MAID in Canada. Um, in order to be deemed eligible, you have to meet all of a number of conditions. So you have to be eligible for health funding in Canada. That's important because they didn't want any um, medical tourism happening. Um, generally, you have to be 18 years of, of age and capable of making your own health care decisions. So emancipated minors, um, it's still a challenging issue that hasn't yet been fully resolved. People have to have a, grie a grievous and an irremedial medical condition. They have to be terminally ill. So people struggling with, uh, with illnesses that won't kill them in the imminent future are not eligible. And lots of, there was a big debate in the Senate about this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they have to make a voluntary request for this without pressure, and they have to be provided informed consent after being informed of their options, and that means their medical diagnosis has to be discussed, available forms of treatment, and available options to alleviate their suffering, including palliative care. People with mental illness are eligible for medical assistance in dying as long as they meet all the other conditions. So mental illness alone is not sufficient to make them eligible for this service, which is really inconsistent with a lot of, um, a lot of European countries. Death is, um, in mentally ill people is not reasonably foreseeable, and so they would not be eligible. Um, eligibility is very important to understand because um, should a paramedic become involved in medical assistance in death, they have to actually verify eligibility. Every practitioner has to physically verify it and ask for proof. <coughs> right now, the only people who can determine eligibility are the physicians or nurse practitioners. And it just, it has to be two people. It can be two NPs, it can be two physicians or one of each, it doesn't matter, it has to be two. And there's a 10-day waiting period between the time when uh, somebody can request medical assistance in dying and when the actual uh, administration of the substance occurs. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, the practitioners have to vi visually, like, actually see documentation in order to verify. So irremedial medical condition, well, this is very specific to patients facing imminent death leaving many to wonder whether or not the law actually accomplishes what it, what it should. Um, and that was the substantial debate that happened in the Senate, and they landed on this definition for now. So the disease or d condition or whatever has to be incurable, the suffering has to be intolerable and cannot be relieved to the patient's satisfaction, and death is, is in the foreseeable future. But it's important to recognize that MAID is fundamental change to the scope and philosophy of how we deliver health care in, in Canada. And patients who request MAID do so for a variety of reasons. And uncontrolled pain is rarely only the only reason or the primary reason for an underlying request. More often, people cite their primary motivation as being loss of control or loss of dignity and a desire not to be dependent on others for personal care. In that way, you can see how our legislation doesn't actually meet this need at all. <coughs> 
So in terms of the patient decision, informed consent uh, has to exist, so the patient has to be mentally competent and capable of making decisions at the time the service is provided. And this is because right before the substance is administered, they have to reaffirm their desire to be, to be um, put to death. So when capacity is lost over time, that becomes a problem. I'm gonna talk about substitute decision makers in a minute. The patient can withdraw consent at any time. And um, the challenge with the Saskatchewan approach right now is it doesn't currently address the issue of self-administration, nor does it address non-facility-based administration. So sometimes, you know, what if a paramedic gets called and the patient is unconscious, then what? Who decides? And can the family actually change the mind of the patient? Uh, only three people, as I mentioned, can provide medical assistance in dying, physicians, NPs, and pharmacists. And pharmacists can only, um, ad they can't administer medication, they can only prepare the medication. So really only two people can. Other parties, however, can be involved, and this is where, where this profession comes into play. Allied health, health providers who, present, who prevent, um, provide care on a day-to-day -day basis can be called in. Um, and family members, obviously, can provide support. That said, uh, everybody has to follow the applicable rules under the criminal code and under the provincial and health-related laws. So it's still illegal. It's important to remember that it's still illegal to provide suicide advice or assistance, um, and paramedics are stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, in terms of conscientious objection, Paramedics, not unlike other healthcare providers, are allowed to express objection in participating, but they're caught in our province between conflicting legislation. If they refuse treatment, they're in breach of uh, Section 38 of our ambulance regulations. They could actually face discipline by my college. Unlikely, but they could. Um, again, because paramedic involvement was never contemplated when the government initially drafted MAID, uh, policy and process um, have, have not incorporated the paramedics in this, and so now we're playing catch up with the law. So from a regulatory perspective, it's very unlikely if we had a paramedic go out to a call and they discovered it was made and they said they would not participate, it's very unlikely we would prosecute them under the other act, but you can see that um, we, have some, we have some logistics to deal with here in ensuring that, that our, prof our professionals are not offside the legislation. Um, in terms of practice implications, I'm sure you can appreciate that the potential for issues is, is significant. Um, paramedics can be, provide, uh, can be found guilty of culpable homicide unless they bring their actions within the approved terms and activities defined within the criminal code. So how do they do this? Uh, because paramedics are not identified as a profession that can help with MAID, they can only work under the direction of a doctor or an NP. They can't directly treat the patient. But even if they participate um, by starting an IV, they could face prosecution. And at the same time, they shouldn't even start the IV without proving eligibility. So it doesn't protect the paramedic in any way from civil liability or from being prosecuted. So the real question is, why would paramedics ever be involved? And when MAID was first introduced, we reached out to our Ministry of Health in the province and requested involvement in planning for the service delivery. And the ministry response was, well, I, I don't know why you would think paramedics could actually be involved. They're not allowed to be, so they won't be. And in their thinking, it was extremely unlikely that they'd ever be called in. But in reality, this is not how things are playing out. And that's not going to be a surprise to anybody in this room because they're usually the first responder when emergencies happen and families get desperate. So when the ministry developed the protocol, they didn't contemplate any involvement by this profession, so there's no mention of how they fit in, and there's no role defined. <laughs> so everybody's just kind of flying by the seat of their pants. Um, what happened was we discovered that paramedics were being called in to, to start IVs um, and then do some symptom relief, and they absolutely can't be doing that if, they're, if that could contribute to the end of life piece. And they weren't being told that these were made patients. So um, we've had them come in, uh, being called in to do transfers, which are pretty innocuous unless they're asked to do symptom relief. IV starts. Um, and probably the, the biggest and most troubling part of all of this is that in a need, um, 
to provide patient confidentiality and, pri confidentiality and privacy. There's no discussion of the fact that the patient is actually planning to end their life. There's no, um, there's no mention or no, the paramedic has not been allowed to actually examine the patient. They're being brought in and told that they must do this. And they have no ability under, under Section 38 of our Ambulance Act to refuse to treat. So they're caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, and th our debate with the ministry <laughs> continues on why we think paramedics will and, sh and are involved. Uh, I don't believe we landed here because the ministry was intentionally trying to be difficult, but I think our challenges arise from a fact that um, the government is attempting to streamline care by making a, um, determinations based on a straight line approach. So what I mean by that is that the provider skills will all be equal, the patient needs will all be the same, and the families all want the same thing. And we all know that that's not the case. Patients are unpredictable and so are families. So the current model for made services is missing elements of process that involve other practitioners, especially paramedics. Um, paramedics are, in most cases, or in many cases, uh, the most skilled people to start IVs. It, it wouldn't be the nurse practitioner, and it, it would probably wouldn't be the doc. So something as simple as that, or simple as how do we get the patient to the facility, because now in Saskatchewan we're only doing facility-based made. How do you get them there? Well, you call the paramedic, and in the meantime, the person has anxiety, and they want the paramedic to administer something for anxiety. So let's further complicate this, and let's talk about what happens when a patient decides to self-administer medication. And I want to, again, preface this by saying that in Saskatchewan, we don't currently allow them to self-administer, but most patients who want to, who are at end of life or making that choice want to do so in their own in environment. They don't necessarily want to go into a clinical setting. Bill C-14 explicitly acknowledges that self-administration has to be available to patients. Um, they need to be able to, to receive assistance outside of a hospital setting, so the law was drafted accordingly. Um, that said, self-administration may not be a part of our landscape for a while because of uh, the availability of specific medications. But um, I pulled some really interesting information from data from the states, actually, uh, that spoke to the complications that arise out of self-administration. So data from Oregon's experience with self-assisted uh, self death uh, thus far suggests that of 991 total patients who self-administered, about half didn't have a medical provider. And there were 27 complications uh, in the 556 cases that were actually reported. Um, six reported cases in 17 years where patients regained consciousness. Um, complications aside, of the 536 cases where data was available, there was a reported time range from ingestion to death of one minute to 144, uh, 104 hours with a median time of 25 minutes. So if you're the family sitting in the room waiting for your loved one to die and they're still not gone after 45 minutes, an hour, you might pick up the phone and ask for some help. And so this has not yet been contemplated by our province. Data from the Netherlands in another study suggests similar issues. So of 114 cases of assisted death, 10% uh, had a technical problem, 7% uh, had complications, 15% uh, had longer than expected time to death or never actually ever extreme became comatose. And the median time to death was 30 minutes with a range of one minute to 14 days. Again, that is a very long time to wait if you think that you're actually going to die imminently. And in 18% of the cases where a physician was pr pr present, um, they decided to administer lethal medication for obvious reasons. So given these stats, you can see how a family might call for help. And this is really where the rubber hits the road for us. Um, our, our EMS folks, our um, uh, paramedic services folks get called for a num any number of things, but least of, not the least of which is if family members see somebody struggling. So the appropriate response um, when a paramedic is called to the scene and the patient is struggling to die, we, we sought out a legal opinion so that we could provide our members with some advice. And this was the question of the hour. And our legal advice says that um, if you're asked to administer life-saving treatment, you can do so only if the patient requests it. And the patient can change their mind at any time. If the family requests it, even if the power of medical power of attorney exists, uh, they cannot administer help. So this is a big problem because um, 
you know, lots of family may feel distressed by what they see. They may have never seen death, and they may not um, understand it, and they may want to bring their loved one back. But the patient decides, not the substitute decision maker. Um, it doesn't matter whether MAID has been initiated or um, uh, whether, whether it has or has not been initiated. Our advice to members is that uh, they can really only take direction from a physician or nurse practitioner, and even then they should not be um, resuscitating unless the patient asks for it. So if the, if the paramedic attends a call and the patient appears to be in distress and they've changed, the family's changed their mind, as I mentioned, they can't change their mind. But what's more difficult is where it's unclear whether or not the patient has actually changed their mind. And this is conceivable, obviously, when a loved one um, is called in to, uh, calls a paramedic in to resuscitate somebody who's minimally conscious and, and insists that they change their mind right, right after ingesting the medication. And the paramedic may, paramedic may be uh, torn between whether this is true or not true. Uh, again, it's really tough because they're going to have to make a decision based on a case-by-case -case situation. Um, and uh, the Ontario College of Physicians and Surgeons actually amended their policy and said that, you know, in cases where a physician disagrees with the substitute decision maker about full resuscitation, that um, they should try and reach agreement if they can't they should go ahead and administer resuscitation, but only if, it's, uh, if the patient is still going to be able to return to the prior previous level of function or a reasonable level of function. Um, we don't, the paramedics do not have the same protection under the criminal code, so um, our advice is always to, to not get involved. So what the worst case is a paramedic gets called to a scene and they don't know it's a made case then they have to treat the patient as if it was a regular patient and resuscitate. Um, as mentioned, this is a real problem for us. Uh, paramedics are not being informed. It's a big, big secret. Uh, and in this circumstance, our advice is just to treat them as they would normally within their scope of practice, following normal treatment protocols. What if self-administered meds don't work or appear to not work, and uh, the family wants you to help them finish their lives and end their lives. Um, our legal advice tells us again that treatment is never allowed, even if it appears the patient is struggling. So they can't participate. And so that puts the paramedic in a terrible spot because they're not used to standing there and just watching somebody pass. Um, but our advice has always been to help the family at that time, uh, not unlike other circumstances that they may walk into. Um, the law does not permit paramedics to assist the patient at, at end of life, even if a doctor says, I want you to administer something to end this. They're not, they're not permitted to do so. Um, what constitutes participation by a paramedic in Saskatchewan? Well, this is a Pandora's box because it, it, where, pa where treatment begins and ends is difficult to define, and anything can be viewed as, as active participation. Starting an IV, as I mentioned, is really the thin edge of the wedge because um, the IV start is the mechanism through which they're going to administer that final me um, medication. And I already talked about uh, symptom relief and the challenges around symptom relief. And in terms of legal, uh, our legal advice suggests, us, suggests that a paramedic is only entitled to assist a nurse practitioner or a physician. They cannot actually assist the patient. Um, that said, if the patient is asking to be resuscitated or to be given an antidote, they can do that. But um, aside from that, if the patient, if the patient is simply um, wanting further assistance to die quicker, they can't do that. So with all of this information in mind, where does that leave the practitioner? And with the introduction of MAID, the issue of liability coverage is becoming very urgent. We do not currently have mandatory liability coverage in Saskatchewan. Um, our paramedic practitioners, where they're employed by a health region, may be covered by the health region, but they may not be covered for anything that potentially is offside of the law. And you can see how there's a lot of gray with respect to medical assistance in death. And so um, our, our advice from the college perspective is that you're going to need insurance. Um, we, are, we are going to make liability insurance mandatory. We have to, to protect the public interest, but also to protect the practitioner. Um, because uh, these circumstances, sometimes the practitioner just bumps up against them and they, they are caught. What's missing? 
Well, we're struggling still to have some acknowledgement by our government that paramedics are actually being included in these processes. And until we get that, we won't be able to define the proper roles and policies to support the process. So um, we'd like to see a script for non-physician, non non-nurse practitioner healthcare providers to use in uh, advising patients. So how do you inform the patient understanding the laws and ver verifying eligibility? And we need a process map for these same healthcare providers. Uh, the current map only contemplates the involvement of the three, um, the three defined providers. And in closing, I just want to say that although MAID is new and we're attempting to get in front of the train, it's rolling down the track. And so Car Canadian paramedic regulators are working on MAID specific guidelines that nothing has been published yet. It's new territory and many provinces have not considered the potential for EMS and paramedics to become involved and it's putting the practitioner at risk and, and the patient. We end up relying on the work of other health professionals to guide us, which is not sufficient to, to meet the unique needs uh, in Saskatchewan or in Canada. Oopsie. Sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, while the full impact of MAID remains to be seen, there's little doubt that it'll change the delivery of medicine moving forward. And paramedicine, while not seeming to be involved, it actually is proving to be part of the process. The lack of guidance and structure around paramedic involvement in MAID goes beyond simply uh, problematic. It has real moral and Im legal implications for the practitioner and the patient. And it's, it's the responsibility of the regulators, the employers, and the members themselves to make sure they understand the implications of their involvement and their obligations and liabilities arising from that activity. So thank you very much. Thank you.